Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome back to another webinar. Uh, and so today we are going to get started here and we are going to have a continuation of our webinar series between Capacity Building International and Teams. And today we're going to be discussing the international models of merchant management and with Italy being represented for this month's webinar. And we are going to have myself, of course. Uh, my name is Kyle King, Managing Director of Capacity Building International, and we have Harold here from Teams, and then also we are joined by Giovanni from Italian Civil Protection. And so what we're going to cover really briefly, I'll just do a couple of opening remarks about some of the activities we have going on with Teams, and then I'll turn it over to Harold, and then finally over to our presenter today and the panel for the Italian Civil Protection System. So just a reminder, again, if you're new and you haven't joined us in the past, this is a monthly webinar series. We're doing these monthly now as opposed to last year when we were doing these every couple of weeks. And we have opted for different forms of content as well in terms of uh, bringing different topics and issues and conversations into the emergency management community. So we have this monthly webinar series, but then we also have our a biweekly podcast on crisis, conflict, emergency management. And also don't forget, there's still an annual conference coming up this year. And that's going to be 2022 annual conference that's going to be coming out here shortly with more information it's through the planning phases at the moment but i just want to keep that in front of you so that you have that in mind so that you are aware that there will be a conference with teams coming up and then of course we are starting a new teams community as well in case you want to stay in touch on a daily basis with other members from the organization so just a really quick about the the crisis conflict emergency management. So we have the the podcast that's come out that's just started. You might remember Dr. Lucy East, East Hope who joined us last year on a webinar. Um, she joined us there, and also Jim Wilson who was from Medical Intelligence M2 Medical Intelligence. He's coming up in a series uh, pretty soon this month or next month, I should say. And then also we have a newsletter that's going out around uh, in terms of giving some additional information, insights, opportunities to the emergency management community. Feel free to find all of that on your regular podcast networks or on LinkedIn itself. And of course, we have a Teams community that we're building out as well. And so that's really just beginning. Uh, so it's just getting started. But in case you want to be able to connect with other, other members of the Teams community, whether they be, might be in Italy itself or in India or China or anywhere else, this is a great place to do it, to stay connected. And of course, you see on the right hand side there, my, my post, I put a lot of things in the community today. So that's why it's all sort of me there in terms of calls for papers, events, conferences, and things like that. So if you need the link for that, certainly just send me a chat here or message, and I'll certainly send you the link so you can join that as well. You must be, of course, a Teams member to be able to join. And now, just to kick off, we've had 2022, and uh, we started our webinar series in, yeah, here that I, I mentioned. And so in January, we had a kickoff session in February, Spain, and this is Italy. April, we're still working through our different um, contacts to be able to find somebody for Italy. And so we're going to be coming up with a new announcement here shortly in terms of uh, who's going to be presenting then. But I wanted to stop very briefly because, you know, we're all influenced to a certain degree by what's been happening in Ukraine and the conflict that started. I think it was just about one month ago now. Uh, and for me specifically, I was actually working in Ukraine for a couple of years, and I left about uh, four to five days before the conflict started because the U.S. withdrew all personnel out of Ukraine. And so that is where um, Teams has started to provide some support to Ukraine. And also, this is something really interesting because Giovanni was mentioning some of the support that they're providing to Ukraine, which I hope we get into as well. But I wanted to give a quick overview, and, and Harold will follow up with this in, in terms of some additional remarks, but a quick overview of what we're looking at in terms of Ukraine. This is the latest sort of humanitarian um, issues and snapshot coming out of OCHA. And some of the remarkable numbers that we're seeing in terms of the conflict is 6.5 million people that are being displaced throughout Ukraine itself. And of course, 3.6 million of those people who have been displaced have crossed international borders to neighboring countries since the 24th. Yeah, exactly one month ago uh, since the conflict actually started. And I'm more familiar with sort of the NATO and international baselines and, and resilience baselines. But, you know, when we talk about NATO and baselines, there's what we typically have of a 2% of your population movement as a baseline that nations need to be able to handle. Well, if you have smaller nations like um, let's say Moldova, and you're getting 371,000 people, you know, that strains the systems. That's very difficult to deal with and get in with. Not only is the conflict extremely difficult, but the pressure that's being applied on a, the surrounding countries as well. 
So that's something that is is a growing and it's going to continue to grow in terms of a humanitarian catastrophe. And that's one of the reasons why we have reached out because I was in Ukraine because I talked to Harold and there's an interest of teams that we have actually started to support Ukraine itself. And so teams is supporting Ukraine. Uh, we recently, as, as an organization, signed a memorandum of understanding with Health of the Ukraine People Foundation. That's basically categorizing different levels of support as a general MOU, which means we're providing virtual expertise and support in an especially difficult, challenging environment around the topic of emergency management and, and disaster management. And of course, uh, develop, one of the things that we're looking at in terms of a project is developing an incident management system specifically for the healthcare facilities for uh, logistics and, and resource capabilities. As you can imagine, as you've probably heard, you know, there's just thousands and thousands of tons of humanitarian aid going into Ukraine. And then how that's disseminated with the logistics behind that, the WHO and UNOCHA are there and working in sort of distribution and logistics networks. But once we look at the healthcare facilities, the there's sort of a lack of an incident management system within the healthcare facilities themselves in terms of uh, support with doctors and logistics and also patient care, treatment options, et cetera. <clears throat> so we're developing a system and that's being supported by Amazon and which is, you know, Amazon Web Services. And one of the things that is critically important there is the information security aspect. And so then any information is uh, not going to be used against the Ukrainian people or anything else like that that might become a threat for them. So Amazon is supporting and of course teams in partnership with the foundation. And this is going to integrate with UNOCHA and WHO efforts on the ground. I'm part of the health cluster there and for the humanitarian assistance programs that are currently in place. And the pilot program we're looking at launching in April 2022 and starting with 10 healthcare facilities in the specific region of Ukraine, and then growth to include um, additional assistance may include also teams workshops, the use of teams experts, and of course, uh, any type of opportunity for teams and the HOUP foundation or the foundation in Ukraine itself to put together applications for grants, and things like that to be able to enhance their capabilities to support the civilian population and the humanitarian assistance inside Ukraine is something we'll be looking at as well. So this is something relatively new. This is what's happening now in, in terms of the day-to-day -day negotiations and development in very, very challenging times. It's very challenging in terms of, I think, uh, 100 and at last count that I heard, about 104 hospitals had been targeted uh, during the start of the conflict. So it's an ever-changing and evolving environment, and that's something that we are actively trying to assist with. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Harold for some additional remarks. Harold, over to you. Thank you, Kyle, and uh, hello, everybody listening in. I looked at those listening in. There was a lot of uh, people from Italy, of our friends in Italy. And uh, as I told Giovanni at the little opening we had here, we also, teams have a chapter in Italy, as we have in 16 other countries. And uh, I also saw that um, Simona Cavallini, who is the president, she is listening in. And I believe that Giovanni and um, Simona have to get in contact after the, today. So I hope that we can stretch more out also to the civil protection. I also like to address a little bit the follow up on uh, what uh, Kyle said about Ukraine. I know he knows Ukraine much better than me, but teams had our annual conference in Ukraine, in Kyiv, actually in 2017. So we have a lot of good friends in Ukraine. And uh, I also had the opportunity to be in Kharkiv before that. And knowing that Kharkiv now is mostly in ruins, it's terrible to know. And um, teams fully support Ukraine, and we hope that this uh, terrible uh, war is going to end some way. You know, Norway, we are a little country. We are a member of NATO, and actually the general secretary of NATO is the former uh, uh, prime minister in Norway, um, Jens Stoltenberg. And I was happy to know that he today actually prolonged his stay for one more year. Actually, he has taken on a new job in Norway as the, as the top, uh, top bankman of the Norwegian bank. But as he had to prolong his stay with NATO, which is supported fully, he actually resigned from that job. And I think that was a wise decision. Norway have a small 
border with Russia, and there has always been, as uh, reported, a good relationship between uh, Norwegian and Russians up in the north in Kirkenes. And, and, uh, and we tried, as I understand, also to keep up that relation, relationship with the Russian people up there. And fortunately, the news report that the mayor and people on the leaders on the other side showed up with the, the seta on their breast and really took the stand for Putin. So I don't think that's actually possible now. It's a pity, but uh, we live in different times. And I actually want you, uh, Giovanni, if you is, is possible, to address a little bit how does this war affect Italy and the civil protection? Do you prepare differently now? Because if this escalates, we do, do see a different situation in Europe. I was born during World War II. And I've lived in a time where everything has gone upwards. It's been a fantastic development. And I did not believe that this should happen in my lifetime. With that, uh, we, I really look forward to uh, listen to you, Giovanni. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Kai. Thank you very much, Harald for the presentation. I'll do my best to try to share what we are doing in Italy and how we are structuring our system and what are also the consequences of this conflict uh, that are, of course is not affecting uh, uh, directly us for the time being, uh, but uh, certainly he has some consequence on uh, the way we work. Knowing that there are a few Italians uh, listening, most probably some of the things I will say will not sound new to most of them but uh, it's always useful to repeat. Uh, as you probably know, Italy is a disaster-prone country. Huh? Uh, despite the fact that the 70% of our territory is a very high seismic risk, uh, we have uh, 10 volcanoes, two active and, and eight quiescent, in addition to several other uh, submarine volcanoes. Then we have over the 80% of the Italian territory uh, which has high hydraulic and hydrogeological risk. So most of the municipalities uh, of our territory uh, in, uh, on our territory are affected by hydrogeological risk. During summer time mostly, but also during winter time in some region of our country, we have a very high forest fire risk. And uh, uh, that's uh, something uh, uh, that, uh, as Harald was saying, you were discussing yesterday with some uh, Italian colleagues uh, in, uh, in another meeting. So I, I'm sure you are familiar with that. And at the same time, having so long coast and so high seismic risk on, on our uh, territory, we also have a very high risk of tsunamis. Uh, just to give you an example, in 2003, we had a tsunami of over then with uh, waves over 10 meter high on the island of Volcano, called uh, Volcano Island, which is a small island in the southern part of the country. It's a very touristic area. We were very lucky that in that case, uh, the tsunami arrived on the 30th of December, so nobody was on the beach. But uh, that's certainly one of the uh, issues that we have to, to deal with. Uh, we have to be prepared to deal with it. Then due to climate change, we are uh, um, witnessing an increasing risk of droughts, uh, not only in the southern part of the country, but also in the northern part of the country. In the last days, for example, we have recorded a very uh, low level in the rivers on the northern part of, of, uh, of Italy, which most probably will bring uh, to problems of droughts uh, in the coming months. So in addition to the natural, so-called natural risk, we also have natural hazard. We also are, have uh, a number of other risks that are, have very little to do with natural hazards. And the, for example, we have more than 1,000 industrial plants uh, at significant risk on our territory. And we also have nuclear risk, not only despite the fact that Italy is not, does not have any more a nuclear power plant, we are 
uh, we have to deal with the remain of, uh, of the power nuclear power plant we used to have in the past, and uh, all uh, our neighbors uh, are, are, add, are adding and that they manage uh, nuclear power plants. So that's also another risk we have to be prepared for. Uh, having said that, it means that we have, like, uh, when we make these presentations, we say that uh, Italy is like a big risk shopping mall. You can have whatever you can think of. And then, uh, as you all know, Italians are full of uh, fantasy, and uh, uh, and they do there sometimes they have a, a special ideas, as you can see from the picture on the bottom of the screen. Uh, this is uh, absolutely one of the worst emergencies we had in recent years due to man-made, uh, uh, man no-discussion emergency we had to deal with, which was Costa Concordia. Another type of emergency we have to deal with is this, uh, the, let's say, lack of control on the land, land use in the last uh, decades. I don't know if you are familiar with this small mountain that I'm showing now on the screen, but this small mountain is the Vesuvius uh, volcano. And the, the Vesuvius is an active volcano. It is still active. And our scientists are telling us that sooner or later something will happen at the Vesuvius. And the, the last eruption of Vesuvius was 1944 during the second world conflict. And as you can see from the picture I'm showing you uh, now, uh, this is the same picture more or less made it taken in 44 at the time of the last eruption and in 2006. As you can see, we have, we as Italian authorities, we have allowed to build illegal houses uh, in the red zone near to the uh, crater, of the main crater of uh, Vesuvius, in an area that according to our planning and our plans will be uh, certainly covered by ashes. That's the, the best case scenario in case of the reference uh, event that we are expecting for Vesuvius. And this, I'm showing you this just to say that we have probably lacked of controlling the, the, uh, what was happening in uh, area at risk. And now we have to deal with, let's say, the, the heritage of our lack of control of the land use. This is, let's say, the, the picture of what, what is how our territory looks like and how our uh, risk profile is today. Uh, but we are, have been uh, always, we were aware of this situation. We had to uh, learn very soon uh, how to deal with the natural and man-made disaster on our territory. Uh, as I said, having so many hazards, we had to, to create a si systems uh, able to uh, at least manage the emergencies. As I said, uh, and as I showed you from the last slide, probably we, were not, uh, we are not good. We were certainly not good enough in uh, uh, prevention activities. But, uh, uh, and, and that's, we uh, still have a long way ahead in front of us to, to improve our capacity to prevent, to, to work on prevention. But at, in, the, in the last century, we have been working a lot, a lot on uh, building systems able to manage emergencies, at least, and to uh, recover after the emergencies. Just to show you a few of, of the events that affected our territory in the last 120 years. This is just a, a listing, and I'm just, I will just focus on some of those. For example, the 1908 earthquake of Messina Street. This is an, uh, why I'm mentioning this earthquake, which was a 7.1 uh, earthquake. Uh, it's because our scientists are telling us that something similar may happen again in Messina. 
And that's why we, that's one of the big ones we are planning for, uh, to, to manage this kind of uh, a potential uh, strong earthquake between Sicily and Calabria. And uh, the, we are working on the planning. And uh, just to give you an example, the same thing that happened on the Vesuvius happened also in the area of Messina and Calabria. Uh, a lot of uh, houses not respecting uh, building codes uh, were uh, allowed to be built in that area. And this is something that is, goes much beyond uh, the capacities of any possible disaster management or civil protection system. That has something to do with how the, uh, the, the administration is managed on the, uh, in our territory and uh, however as i said we have we have built a system to handle emergencies no, which will never be able to uh, work on building codes for example in sicily and calabria to be prepared for a, uh, next emergencies in uh, on the strait of messina just very quickly other, uh, in the overview of other emergencies we had to deal at national level in, in the last century, uh, just to mention some. Uh, the 1966 uh, Florence, uh, no, Arno River uh, flooding in the city of Florence. This was particularly important for, for our country because, for a number of reasons. Uh, we have learned in, those, in this emergency, for example, the importance of volunteers. In Italy, we have always had a very strong tradition of volunteerism. And uh, uh, however, in that uh, uh, particular case, we have learned that uh, we needed to do something to uh, organize those volunteers. In, in, during, after the flooding of Arno River, there were uh, what we called, they were called on the uh, newspaper at the time, the mad angels. So volunteers come, coming to Florence, not only uh, from Italy, but also from uh, everywhere in the world to support the local authorities and local population to deal uh, with the consequence of the disaster. This was due mostly for because Florence is a, can, uh, is a city full of cultural heritage and uh, uh, globally known for the beauty of the city. So this was uh, uh, this act as a uh, pulling factor for volunteers to come uh, without any organization, just coming there to support. Since then, we have. Uh, understood the, the, the enormous potential of volunteers, but at the same time, the importance of organizing those volunteers. And that's why we built since then a, a system that today allow us to uh, have on our territory over 800,000 registered volunteers uh, willing to support us in case of emergencies. And this is a crucial element in our response system, especially since we, uh, it was decided to abolish the um, uh, mandatory military service for the young people in Italy. So we have lost the availability of a, a high number of soldiers that could help us providing manpower, but we have replaced them in several cases uh, with volunteers. Uh, another very important element of the, that the lessons we have identified, we have learned after the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Arno River uh, flooding of '66 was the fact, uh, the importance of protecting our cultural heritage. As I said, Florence is a city rich of uh, cultural heritage, which is important not only for cultural reason, but mostly because it's also the main source of income of an entire region, of Tuscany region. So the, we have learned the importance of safeguarding our cultural heritage, uh, hopefully preventing the, the effect of disaster, if not to be ready to deal specifically with cultural heritage since the beginning 
of the response operations. After that, we had, after 66, we had a number of other important earthquakes affecting our territory. And what is important, what was extremely important of uh, the one I listed on the screen is because we had in 12 years, we had three strong earthquakes affecting the entire country from deep south to deep north. And uh, it's important the timing of those events because in 12 years, the people still had the memory of previous events. And this created a, a, a very important change in the public opinion on the importance of creating or uh, reshaping the response system because the people still remember the previous, uh, they could compare the different management uh, of uh, the emergencies after the different national, uh, um, you know, those earthquakes that became national emergencies. And this brought us to uh, modify, uh, deeply modify our system. In 1980, after the earthquake of Irpinia, which is nearby Naples, is a region, is an area nearby Naples in the southern part of the country, while we had more than 3,000 victims. And uh, this, uh, what came out in a very clear way in that case, it was that three days after, uh, that the emergencies, there were areas that were not, had not been reached by rescuers 72 hours after the, the main shock. There were enough capacity, but what was completely lacking was the coordination of those capacities. There were areas that were flooded by support teams and other areas that were not uh, even reached by rescuers. This was created a, a great uh, shock in the public opinion. And uh, uh, there was a decision to change the reference law uh, managing disaster management in Italy. And in 1982, the National Civil Protection Department, which is the organization where I'm working, was created exactly with a, a specific uh, objective of managing, of coordinating the response of the entire national system in case of major disaster. Since 1982, there had been a number of laws regulating different aspects of our work. Uh, the most relevant was in 1982, where the foundation of the, how the system is structured were were written, were developed. Okay, uh, all those laws were finally unified in what we call today the Italian Civil Protection Code that was published in uh, 2018, which contains all main uh, acts uh, related to civil protection in Italy. And of course, everything starts from the mandate. Huh? Now I'm just pulling out of the law of 2018, the main important elements. Okay, the mandate is a very broad mandate. And I think it's common to several disaster management organizations around the world, but it's very, very broad because it's uh, the safeguard of human life, health, goods, cultural heritage, settlements, animals, and environment from both natural and man-made disasters. So it's enormous. The, the, uh, the mandate. Uh, uh, being all of you professionals, you would understand immediately uh, how broad is and how complex is this mandate. Uh, one of the characteristics of our civil protection system is that we are working, we are covering the entire uh, emergency cycle. Uh, uh, it's uh, slightly different from uh, the way we are normally used to, to show at international level the disaster risk management cycle, because we focus mostly on what we call the real time. We are working, of course, in prevention, but only uh, in one part of the prevention activities. We are working on preparedness. We work a lot on forecasting, now casting, and early warning, of course. And then we have been mandated our, of course, the more visible, the most visible 
aspect of our work is uh, coordinating the relief activities. And we also work on recovery. I use the word we because, as I said before, the Italian Civil Protection Department is only a coordination body of a system which is composed of many other actors. According to the law, uh, the civil protection in, in Italy is not one organization, but it's a function of, that is carried out by a system of organizations. And basically, uh, all organizations that have a, a, a task in protecting the, the um, no, in civil protection in, um, in, the, in our territory. So basically, our system is composed by the national government, all different ministries, all different regions, the provinces, the municipalities, and all operational structures belonging to the states or to public institutions. To give you an example, the, fire, the National Fire Brigade or the Italian Army uh, or the police forces, all of them are part of the Italian civil protection system. The law, and this is one of the characteristics of our system, is that the law says that also the scientific and academic community uh, is part of the uh, civil protection system, national system. And we, I will tell you a few words later on how this happened, how we managed to have a scientific and academic community within our system. And another very important pillar of our system is the uh, civil society uh, in two, uh, at two levels. The volunteers, as I said before, and also all private companies that are um, and handling uh, public services. Just think to telecommunication companies or the railway company. All of them are, are considered as part of, of the system. Um, now, how do we make all this complex system working? If we look at the organigram at the national level, the system is structured in this way. Uh, our, my department, the Italian Civil Protection Department, belongs to the Prime Minister's office. It's one of the offices of the Prime Minister. So we are, in a way, above the other ministries. Uh, we work, of course, together with all the ministries, the one that you see listed in yellow, and with all the local uh, authorities uh, that are highlighted in green in the on the screen. Each of the ministry or the local authorities is overseeing the so-called operational components of the system. If I, I take an example, if I take the Ministry of Health, for example, they oversee to the uh, Emergency, medical emergency services, uh, which in Italy are organized at the regional level, for example. But these are under the, let's say, everything is coordinated under the Ministry of Health and the regions. So that, this is the organigram, uh, how it's uh, in theory organized at the national level. However, not all emergencies are national emergencies. In fact, the, our system is structured based on the principle of subsidiarity. And the law highlight three, no, identify three levels of emergencies, A, B, and C. The, the emergency, the type A emergency is the emergency that can be, has to be dealt at the local level. So at the level of the municipality. It means that at the local level, the mayor will have the political responsibility and operational responsibility of handling this emergency with the resources present at the local level. For example, the technical offices of the municipalities. Of course, this will be done 
uh, in coordination and together with, with the, the national operational components that are present on the local uh, at the local level. Just to give you an example, uh, in Italy mostly uh, the fire brigade activity, the fire fighting activities are managed by the national fire brigade. The National Fire Brigade have local offices, local branches in the different, in the most relevant municipalities. Those local branches will work together with the mayor uh, to manage the emergencies at the local level. Uh, this is for the A type emergencies. If we go to the higher level, it's the B type emergency, which is an emergency which can be dealt or should be dealt either at provincial or regional level. And this happens when either the affected area is larger than the territory of one municipality, or if it's too serious the emergency to be dealt by a single mayor. Uh, and this brings to, uh, let's say, we go at the higher administrative level to manage the emergency, which normally is the regional level, it's uh, the, uh, the uh, governor of the region, which will coordinate uh, with all the resources available at, uh, at the provincial or regional level and, and with all the national components present on the, at the regional level. In those two cases, the, the, uh, my department will not intervene unless we, uh, it's requested to intervene by the authority in charge. We will just monitor the situation and we will facilitate the uh, delivery of uh, assistance by the different components of the system. And of course, very often, the government will also pay the, the cost at the end of the emergency, will reimburse the different expenses that are uh, at least part of those expenses that, that are done during the emergency management. And now we arrive to the C type emergency, which is the national or international emergency. This is the emergency where we have a declaration of, of a state of emergency at the national level. In that case, there is a, a declaration of state of emergency which gives to the head of the department, of the national department, the coordination of the entire operation. And this is what is happening for earthquakes, for example, for volcanic eruptions or for emergencies in, in, like the one of Ukraine, which is considered a C-type emergency for international operation and also national, but mostly international operation for the time being. In that case, the uh, head of the department is given two main powers with the declaration of state of emergency. The first one is uh, uh, the power to issue what we call ordinance, orders. So we have the power to impose decision in case of uh, need, and we can, wa uh, we can waive certain legislation to manage the emergency. The second power we have in our hands is that we receive uh, additional financial resources to, to manage the emergency. And this, of course, as you can imagine, that's very uh, useful in case of major emergencies. How do we operationalize the system in case of national emergency? We convene, we use what we call the operational committee, the civil protection operational committee. This is our main decision body that is convened in case of emergency. It's activated immediately when we have the information, when we have the feeling that there, there will be a declaration of a state of emergency. It's a meeting where uh, we see, uh, the characteristic that the people sitting around the table uh, are mandated by their institution to sit at this decision-making 
table, which means that the decision taken around the table must be immediately operational. The representative of this, this basically, we will see with the following slide, people that are representing the different institutions around this table are at the very high level, just to give you an example. We have the head of the Italian Civil Protection Department who, who speaks on behalf of the prime minister. We have the head of the fire brigade, the National Fire Brigade. We have normally the chief of staff of the Italian Armed Forces and so on and so forth. So the, the people sitting around this table have the must have the power to engage their own organization without any uh, without losing a single uh, minute they, they they cannot say i need to consult with my minister they have to have the power to take the decision those people are pre-identified and they uh, they know that they have to be in our headquarters in less than one hour after they they, uh, they are called so we have this uh, operational committee, which is a flexible organization, and the, the composition of this organization varies very uh, according to the type of emergency we are in. And this uh, meeting will continue, will be run 24-7 for the first days of the emergencies. And then we will, until we open uh, the, a coordination office on site where uh, the event uh, happened. To work and to take the informed decision, this operation committee received two information influx. The, the first one is the, let's say, the information on how the situation is developing. And this happened thanks to what we call the Stala Situation Italia, which is an operational room of, uh, where we see the presence 24-7 of uh, representatives of all main operational components of the Italian system, from the fire brigade to the armed forces to the police and the Coast Guard and so on. And this is the only place in Italy where we have full-time presence of all the operational components to, in the same room. And their task is basically, when we have the, to monitor, of course, the situation, and if something happened, they will gather information from their uh, different uh, operational rooms. So the police force will gather information from their people, from the, their people on site, from their national operation center, and, and as they do the, all the other operational components. And at the end, we will build, let's say, a, a situational picture uh, putting together the information coming from all the different operational components. And this will be provided to the people sitting at, uh, in the operational committee. So all of them will work based on a common situational picture, which we know in real life, it's not very common. Very often, we, each organization works on, based on their own information, not on a shared situational picture. At the same time, the other information flow coming uh, to the operational committee is coming from what we call the Centro Funzionale Centrale, or the, let's say, the technical support center that we have in our department. And this is uh, a center that basically is uh, the coordination hub of the regional Centri Funzionali. Each region has its own or should have its own uh, Centro Funzionale technical center that basically uh, work on forecasting and monitoring of major risk scenario. That's uh, on the screen you can see what we do for uh, hydrometeorological risk, but we have the same thing for seismic risk or volcanic risk and all main risk affecting our territory. And basically their, their main task is to translate the technical data into information for decision making. 
you are professional, you know what I, I'm referring, but what is what we have learned in our experience that it, it's uh, of crucial importance is to have this scientific and technical component within our organization, because the, based on those two information flow, the situational awareness, the technical uh, info, uh, data on the event, we are able to build scenarios to take informed decision in very short time. I have to speed up because I was I spoke too long. Just to go quickly to the national resources, Italy can uh, the Italian civil protection system can mobilize a huge number of resources. And this is also one of the reasons why Italy, when it was also struck by disaster in recent years, did not request international assistance. Because Italy has developed in the years a very uh, high number of resources. And having so many operational components, uh, this has uh, allowed us to create now, to have a huge number of available resources on our national territory. Just to give you an example, each region in our territory has, uh, must have what we call a Colonna Mobile Regional, a regional Response Unit, which is built uh, in different ways, but respecting national guidelines on this matter. And those regional response units uh, should be ready to go wherever is needed in very few hours. Then, of course, we have the resources belonging to the different uh, operational components of the state, the fire brigade, the coast guard, the fire brigade, also the forest for, for forest fire activities. I mentioned before the volunteers, just to say a quick one. We uh, have um, learned the importance of the volunteers, and we decided in Italy to, uh, that we work with organized volunteers. Uh, we know already that there will always be the so-called last-minute volunteers, but in our system, we made the choice to work mostly with organized volunteers. We build a legal framework for them. We are, work, we are giving them resources to train, to uh, equip themselves, and to uh, ensure themselves, but that's the choice. Uh, we prefer not to have to deal with individual volunteers. The volunteers, when we activate them, uh, they are protected not only by insurance, but also we reimburse the employer uh, that are uh, releasing those volunteers in case of need. Uh, I skip a few slides because we are too long, just to go to the international activities. Of course, Italy is very active at the international level, the Italian civil protection. It's very active uh, at the UN level. We work, of course, we are the focal point for the uh, for Sendai on disaster risk reduction. We, uh, we are the coordinating body of the national uh, platform for disaster risk reduction. Of course, we are also in, uh, working with WHO, mostly with the emergency medical team section of WHO. We work with UN OCHA and so on. And of course, also at the European level, we are uh, very active in the Union Civil Protection Mechanism. I don't know if you, all of you are familiar with it, but that's basically the coordination of, the, of over 30 uh, civil protection authorities of 30 countries, not only the European Union, but also other countries that have requested to, take, to be part of this mechanism. Uh, we don't have time to, to go into that, uh, but just for a uh, few pictures to see that uh, as Italian civil protection, we have been uh, working in recent years in, in uh, more or less everywhere. Uh, there were major disasters all over the world, from Iran to Mozambique to South Sudan to China, uh, also to Russian Federation and uh, providing different type of support uh, from uh, response teams, emergency medical teams, uh, forest fire planes, or uh, technical expertise also, because the good thing of having a system so complex as I showed you before is that we can uh, utilize 
experts, also individual experts coming from universities and uh, to deploy them under civil protection, just to give you an example. And I leave the last two, three minutes to speak about Ukraine. Okay. Uh, regarding Ukraine, we are working both uh, internationally and in Italy. It, it was decided by the Italian government to uh, declare a state of emergency for international uh, for an international emergency to support Ukraine or the neighboring country to Ukraine dealing with the, the influx of refugees. And on the, on the other hand, it was decided also to declare state of emergency to deal with a potential influ massive influx of refugees from Ukraine on Italian territory. The Italian Civil Protection Department, my department, was given the responsibility to coordinate both of them. So uh, now, at the international level, we are, have been pro we are providing we have assistance to Ukraine. Unfortunately, we are not authorized to enter into Ukrainian territory. So we are now working mostly through the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, delivering assistance to Poland or Romania for further delivery on Ukraine uh, at the border to the Ukrainian authorities. We have, uh, just to give you a few figures, but these are changing daily. We have deployed one camp into Poland for 1,000 people. And uh, we, uh, that's for, to be brought into Ukraine. We have uh, deployed to the EU hub in uh, Romania, 23 ambulances and over 25 trucks of medical equipment which leader by leader uh, is now going, is now delivered into Ukraine. Uh, at the same time, we are performing medevac flights from Poland, uh, and we have already done over 40 medevac into Italy. And uh, in the last two days, we have built one camp in Slovakia for uh, 250 people, and one in Moldova we delivered yesterday for 500 people. So that's what we are doing at the international level. At the national level, we are also uh, planning for massive influx of, uh, um, of refugees. Uh, for the time being, we are still using the ordinary uh, tools to deal with the refugees, to provide assistance to refugees. So it's the Ministry of Interior of Italy handling that. But all our regions are planning and creating contingency plans and uh, for potential massive increase of refugees in the coming weeks that we hope it will not happen, but we have to be ready if this will happen. So I think I spoke also too long and uh, I'm uh, available to answer possible questions. Over to you, Kai. Thank you very much, Giovanni. A very good and insightful presentation. Really appreciate that. Uh, we just had, and I think we just have a, a few minutes left because uh, we are going a little bit long, but the there was a question about the volunteer system, and I think that that's really interesting. So you you have said that you, there's 800,000 volunteers, but you have organized it, or not you particularly, but the, the Italian system has organized it to where you're dealing with, if I understood correctly, organizations, not individual volunteers. So volunteer organizations. And you're doing that largely for sort of liability and reimbursement purposes. Uh, could you spend just a couple of minutes explaining that? To, because that's an interesting sort of relationship yeah. we as we've seen with many disasters you get a, a million volunteers but it can be chaos so it seems like you've learned from that experience that's exactly the reason why it was chosen in the past to, to uh, deal uh, with individual not with individual but uh, with uh, organized volunteers the, the way we, we structure the system is that we um, we can, we have Okay, anyone, anyone who wants to create an organization can do it. There are rules to, to be followed. And this organization has to be recognized either at the local level or at national level. It depends on the size of the organization. So there are some, you know, the, they have to be registered uh, with, a, uh, with those uh, roster of organizations. And then uh, if you are registered, you can get funding for the, your activities, for example. 
and in case of emergency we can uh, we can activate the organization either directly or through the, uh, the regional authorities it's, it's a bit complex to explain you how but basically we can request an organization to provide us volunteers for a specific activity. In case this organization uh, is providing us uh, personnel, we will, uh, as government or, or as region, we will reimburse the employer of uh, the, the volunteer. So the, the employer will not lose the money uh, for those, if those volunteers will serve for us. And this is, let's say, a crucial point in our system because uh, we have more volunteers on one hand, and uh, and then also the employer are, ha are not unhappy. Let's say. No, that's very interesting. Thanks, and um, the liability, I think, is a big thing as well. So that's that's, yeah. a, that's a great point there. Okay, great, uh, Harold. Do you have any final remarks? No, I enjoyed your presentation, Giovanni. Very instructive and also a little bit different than other organizations we have presented. So this is a good thing that we see different ways to organize and you seem to have done it very well. And uh, I will then see too that um, uh, Simona and yourself getting good contact. So teams and uh, civil protection will uh, work closely together in Italy. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. And in case of need, uh, you can write me an email and try to answer if you have, if you want more information on different uh, on, on aspects. I'll try to yes. answer to your request. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks again for joining our webinar series. And we will certainly have a recording and we'll post that as well so that you can watch this uh, later on if you want to review sort of the details of the presentation and everything. If you do have any questions or if you need any further information, you know, certainly please let me know. You can uh, just respond to the emails that you'll be receiving and then you just can hit reply and then I'll get those as well. Or you can reach out to Harold. And if you have any other questions or recommendations or you'd like to see other presentations, certainly let us know as well. We'd like to be able to fulfill those requests. So thanks again, everybody, and really appreciate it. Thanks, Giovanni. Thanks for joining us.